Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Thursday, the 27th of January. So we had community cafe this morning and I'm so thankful to all of those volunteers who gave of their time and their energy. We had another amazing cake and, and the, the beautiful thing about these volunteers, the ones who help out here at community cafe. Well, we've got, we've got people from church who come along and they help out. But we have people from the community. And, and I think of times when I've been on my own and you've got people from the community who help um, clear up, put away tables and chairs and spray things down. And, and it's such an amazing sense of community, this, this gift that we have been given. Now, today is Holocaust Memorial Day. And we all like um, stories. We've all got our own stories to share, our own stories to, to hold on to. And I thought, let's begin um, with this story that I came, I came across on one of these, um, these pages for the Holocaust Memorial. As they stepped from the cattle car at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Killing Center in 1944, Benno Helmer was surrounded by his family for the last time. They put us in lines, they put us all together, and then they separated us. And I didn't want to leave my mother, Benno remembered, decades later, breaking into tears. Benno was directed one way while he watched a German official direct his mother, father, and brother in the opposite direction. What he did to my sister, I didn't see. Benno survived Auschwitz, other camps, and forced labor. After the war, he visited town after town, searching for his family. One day, outside a displaced person camp in Landsberg, Germany, he was stopped at an intersection when a man yelled from a truck, How's Sonia? Benno replied that his sister was dead. The man said, I just saw her. Sonia was a common enough name. Benno wasn't sure what to believe, but he kept searching. During another chance encounter, he met a woman who said she knew Sonia. In fact, Sonia was hosting a New Year's Eve party in a town in the region of Westphalia, Germany. Benno and the woman headed to the train station, but it wasn't running because of the holiday. The next morning when they arrived, a woman answered the door and called for Sonia to greet her guests. She says hello, Benno remembered. At first she didn't realize it was me, then Sonia fainted. On New Year's Day, 1947, Benno was reunited with his sister. And as we think of the pain and the horrors that are caused by, by the Holocaust, we think of moments like these that continue to give us joy. As you come into this time of prayer today, what is the story that, that you bring? What are the joys? What are the places of pain? And, and what a privilege it is to come into this time to, to come just as we are and to offer to God um, the stories of our lives. So let's turn to evening prayer, which is on page 232. Um, our readings for today are Psalm 24, Hosea chapter 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So let's just pause for a moment as we as we surrender to God and ask for him to, to bless the stories of our lives, the story that continues to unfold. So let's just pause. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your glory is proclaimed in all the world. Blessed are you, sovereign God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. You gave your Christ as a light to the nations. And through the anointing of the Spirit, you established us as a royal priesthood. As you call us into your marvelous light, may our lives bear witness to your truth and our lips never cease to proclaim your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
blessed be God forever. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. So let's turn to our psalm, which is Psalm 24, and we're on page 680. <clears throat> the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, the compass of the world and all who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and set it firm upon the rivers of the deep. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord or who can rise up in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to an idol nor sworn an oath to a lie. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let us pray. O Lord of hosts, purify our hearts that the King of glory may come in, your Son, Jesus, our Redeemer. So let's turn to our Old Testament reading, which is taken from Hosea. Um, and we rejoin the story where we continue to hear about the judgment um, on Israel and Judah. We're reading from chapter 5, verse, verse 8, to chapter 6, verse 6. And we're on page 853. Blow the horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Sound the alarm at beth -Avon. Look behind you, Benjamin. Ephraim shall become a desolation on the day of punishment among the tribes of Israel. I declare what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who remove the landmark. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment, because he was determined to go after vanity. Therefore, I am like maggots to Ephraim, unlike rottenness to the house of Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king. But he is not able to cure you or heal your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I myself will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will beg my favor. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who is torn and he will heal us. He has struck down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have killed them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Nettles. Sorry. 
So I'll just read that last line again, because we've got to the end of, of the reading. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And just to go back to what Hosea was saying at the start of chapter six, where he tells the people to return to God. So God hadn't called down judgment because he wanted to destroy Israel and Judah. He wanted to restore them. Um, sometimes it, it takes something as extreme as judgment like that to get people to turn back to God. But let's hold on to that because he is the one who heals us. He is the one who binds us up. And let's remember that as we continue to dwell on, to dwell on the, the various chapters in the story of our lives. So let's turn to um, 1 Corinthians. We're reading from chapter 11, verse 2 to 16. And we're on page 169. Now, <clears throat> I must say that this, um, this is a contentious passage. And... Um, I don't know whether you've experienced um, different people with different perspectives, but let's, let's hear this passage. It's about the role of men and women. And um, let's read through this contentious passage. But as we read through it, ask God to reveal his heart to us. So page 169. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I had handed them on to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the husband is the head of his wife and God is the head of Christ. Any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, she should wear a veil. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God. But a woman is the reflection of man. Indeed, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman. But all things come from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head unveiled? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is degrading to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone is disposed to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. And, and I'm sure when you deal with a contentious passage like this, you could argue um, through it one way or the other and hold on to, um, to, to something to, to prove um, our side of the argument. But rather than get into um, taking sides, all of us come with different perspectives. And where Paul ends at, he says, um, if it's contentious, well, we go back to God. We're called to be the body of Christ. And, and if I just go back to that verse, which is verse three, and these discussions can go on about um, headship, about the relationship between man and woman. But if for this evening, we hold on to what it says here. So, the husband is the head of his wife, just like God is the head of Christ. And when we think of God the Father and we think of God the Son, different roles 
but both God. It, um, there is nowhere where it says that God the Son is inferior to God the Father. Both God, both equal, but different roles. So if we think about our relationships with each other, um, we, we are called to, to occupy different roles and most importantly, to fulfill our, our roles in his kingdom. And, and let's hold on to, um, to the debates for another time. Maybe, maybe it will come up in, in question time in church. So again, as we look through scripture, if, if God prompts us to explore something, to ask questions, Let's continue to do that together as the body of Christ. But let's now respond to that in the responsory on page 235. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is rising upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is rising upon you. God's salvation has been openly shown to all people. The glory of the Lord is rising upon you. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is rising upon you. Let's join in the Magnificat, the Song of Mary. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights the anointed one on whom my spirit rests. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel to remember his promise of mercy, the promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, the anointed one on whom my spirit rests. <clears throat> And as we come now into a time of intercession, those words are the words that God the Father said to God the Son. And following on from that passage on headship, rather than thinking about who is the head, um, let's think about the people in our lives, the people in our community, the relationships that we share, and most importantly, this, this context, this relationship that we have with God. And God says to us today, wherever we are at in our story, that we are his beloved sons and daughters and that he delights in us. So let's remember that as we, as we pray for various individuals, let's continue to pray for Andrew. It's, it's, a major surgery that he's going through. It started earlier this, this afternoon and it's likely to, to go on for, for several hours. So let's uphold Andrew. Let's pray for Zukra, who is on life support. And um, yes, and really, really appreciate um, your prayers for my grandmother. Um, let's continue to pray. I know she's ready to go home, but we continue to seek God's will and and wherever else you're at what's going on in the story of your life let's bring that to God heavenly father as we pause in your presence this evening 
we thank you for the way you model love and relationship. And Father, what a beautiful example when you said to your son, Jesus, um, the one who you are head of, where you say that you are my beloved son and I delight in you. Father, we pray that each one of us will hear your words to us this evening. You are my beloved son or daughter. I delight in you. And Father, we, we know that every person in this world has been created in your image. Father, every person in the countries, the far-flung countries that go through um, all of the, that are going through all of this conflict at this time, Father, every individual, every individual in, in Afghanistan and Ethiopia and Yemen and Russia and Ukraine and all of those places that us are grappling with disasters at this time. Father, we pray that in in ways that will be will be meaningful to their souls and their um and their hearts, but in practical ways, oh Lord, that they will know that they are your children and that you delight in them and that it is your desire to restore them. Father, we want to pray that for our community and particularly the individuals we are remembering in a special way today. And Father, as we pray for, for Andrew, as he's going through this surgery, and we, as we, we remember his, his partner and we remember the rest of the family, Father, we pray for, for Zukra and, and her daughter and the rest of the family in Uzbekistan. As we remember Kanchan, and the rest of the, the family, particularly her, her son who lives with her. And why not bring to God people who, who are on your hearts and minds this evening. And as we remember each one, Father, we pray that they and their families will know the words of the Father. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. I delight in you. So Father, we pray that um, your favor, your grace, your mercy will rest upon them. And Father, we ask, we ask for your will. We ask for your peace. We ask for your healing. Father, we pray that this, this surgery for Andrew will be successful. And we pray that you will, you will bring him to, to full recovery. Father, we ask for your hand of, of, of healing and a miracle to work in Zukra's life. Father, we continue to pray for your peace. And Father, we ask that your, your peace and your, your grace and your favor will rest upon families that are bereaved. Father, we continue to hold Osman and his family, Julie Martin's family, and Wilson Eziani's family. Father, we hold them as we gather together as a community in prayer. And remind those families of Father that they are your children and you delight in them. So Father, we offer ourselves to you. We offer you the stories of our lives. Father, you know the places that we struggle with. You know the places that bring us joy. And as we, as we rest in your presence this evening, Father, we pray that, that we will know more of your joy, more of your peace, more of your spirit at work in our lives. Hear our prayer for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
So whatever the ongoing questions, whatever the, the flux, whatever the uncertainty, let's worship with the song which declares that he is faithful, that he is unchanging. collect for this evening. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May Christ who sends us to the nations give us the power of his spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And thank you. Thank you for this time together.
um, we continue to give thanks for for this this community that he has blessed us with so let's continue to to pray for each other uphold each other and and as you go through the rest of the evening may you continue to hear the words of the father you are his beloved child and he delights in you god bless you